In this video we're going to talk about process analysis and look at some of the tools that are available to help in analysing processes. Uh, it's quite a straightforward class and although it's got 55 slides as you can see on the bottom right hand corner uh, we can go through it fairly fast. So first of all we're dealing with process analysis and what we're going to do is look at process flow charting and just a very simple flow charting exercise looking at just very simple ideas associated with flow charting but hopefully ideas that will bring about the importance and the usefulness of flow charting in the uh, decision making process. So we'll look at that and then we'll talk about the types of processes um, quite a general discussion on types of processes um, the process matrix measurements of processes I will do uh, in a very efficient manner because this is the subject matter of other videos and elsewhere in the course as well so we're going to just have an overview of the types of measurements of performance I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, looking at specific measures or the ups and downs and various issues associated with the different measures. So let's look at the first of all the process analysis terms. Well a process is any part of an organization that takes inputs and transforms them into outputs. That's what a process is. It simply converts inputs into outputs. It's a process. Uh, processes do something. So they're converting inputs into outputs. The cycle time is the average time, the average successive time between completion of successive units. It's uh, the cycle time. How how long does it take from start to finish? What's the cycle? So how long from start to finish does it take to do something? And the utilization is the ratio of the time that a resource is actually activated relative to the time that it's available for use. Let's think about it. Um, if a company owns a machine, if it owns the machine, the machine is available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That's 168 hours a week. Seven times 24. Uh, 168 hours a week. 168 hours a week. So that's what the machine is available for, but the machine may only be used two hours a day. So the utilization is, let's say the company works for five days, five times two is ten, ten over 168. Now that's taking the full time. Perhaps we could rework that and talk about it as a working day is eight hours and the machine is run for two hours a day. That means it's 25% utilization. So it depends. Uh, we have to put down some sort of parameters and some sort of guidelines on our calculations and state exactly the assumptions we're making. Now let's look at flow charting and get a simple idea about flow charting and um, some simple uh, insights into this important area of decision making. It's the use of diagrams to present the major elements of a process. So we're going to use diagrams to present the ideas behind processes. The basic elements can include tasks or operations, flows of materials or customers, decision points and storage areas or queues. Well, let's, have a, let's have a brief look at these. It's an ideal methodology by the way by which to begin the Again, analyzing processes. Processes have all of these built in. Processes require decisions. Processes have uh, ideas of queues and waiting times and uh, decisions to be made. So flow charting is important in the context of uh, processes. Let's look at the symbols. Well, tasks or operations could be represented by little rectangles 
and we simply type into the rectangle what the task or the operation is. Um, for example, giving a ticket to somebody entering a cinema. That's a task. Somebody has to give the person the ticket to enter the cinema. It's a task. Or installing an engine in a car. That's a task. Depending on what the nature of the business is, what the activity is, there might be some ticket given to a person or, or some instruction given to a person. It's a task. And we'd write the task into this little rectangular box. A decision point is like a square on one of its corners, tipped onto one of its corners. A decision point is how much change should, should a customer be given. When the customer makes a purchase, they need some change, how much should be given? Or a mechanic might need to know which wrench or which spanner to use in certain circumstances. A decision has to be made. The the engineer, the mechanic, has got a, a whole box of spanners or wrenches and it has to pick out the right one. A decision has to be made. So decision points occur throughout uh, our discussion of processes as well. which What to do under particular sets of circumstances. Uh, a triangle tipped on its apex uh, is a storage area or queue. For example, lines of people waiting for service. Now that's a queue. And then we have the flow of materials uh, or customers, which is this big black arrow here. Um, customers moving to the seat in the cinema. That's a flow of people into seats in a cinema or flows of people into seats in a theatre or whatever. And it could also be a mechanic getting the right tool. So it's it's a flow. The person's moving to get the the tool. So we got a uh, in our case here, we just got four symbols, four uh, brief symbols. We've got tasks, decision points, storage areas, and flows of materials or customers. Um, in real world situations, flow charting can be extremely complex and have many different symbols. So many that there might be a special key to the diagram uh, telling what the different symbols mean. Um, but and decision making can be very complex and can the flow charts can be very detailed, anticipating every possible decision under different circumstances on what course of action should be. So in a sense once uh, a flow chart has been worked out the decision making process has been worked out and it becomes quite objective that it's taken away from the manager any discretionary behaviour. The, the flow chart indicates what should happen under certain circumstances. Now the flow charts may be the product of experience within the business over a number of years. So they've been doing this particular job for many years, they have got experience and then they decide to write it down as a flow chart. So that anybody coming into the business confronting that situation can go to the flow chart and can work out exactly which route to take and what to do. And that is the route that experience indicates is the most appropriate route. So, flow charting is very important. It, in a sense, encapsulates knowledge. It, it, it writes down knowledge and experience and presents it to perhaps new personnel, people who haven't encountered this situation before, and enables them to make good decisions. It could also be used, of course, to indicate how to use a particular product. And we often get this on consumer products when we buy them. We take the product home and find there's a flow chart telling us how to set it up or how to use it or how to troubleshoot it if it's not working. Let's take a, a flow chart, an example of a flow chart for investment in a new machine. So we go invest in a new machine. That's the decision. Do we invest in a new machine? Let's say we decide we will invest in a new machine. Then our decision is, do we invest in the latest version of the machine 
or could we take a, an older version? Another decision. So now we've had two decisions. Invest in a new machine, we think, yes, we will. Decision made. Now, if we make the decision to invest in a new machine, do we invest in the latest version of this machine? This machine will be new to us, new to the to the business, but perhaps the machine is not new. The machine's been around for some years. Now, do we invest in the latest version? Another decision to be made. And let's say we say yes, we will go for the latest version. So, in which case, we move to the task or the operation. The task or the operation is make the investment. Find the machine supplier, contact them, negotiate the price, get a demonstration of the machine, and make the decision and buy the machine make the investment. So we've had two decision points and an operation. And our very simple flow chart takes us in this direction. Of course the decision might be complicated for different reasons. For example, let's go back to the beginning and say invest in a new machine. And let's say we decide no. Let's say we decide we'll use the existing technology. Well that's it. Um, we don't go any further. We, we, we've we made the decision. We've made the decision we're not going to invest in a new machine. So that's the end of the process. We use the existing one. It could be the case we decide yes, we'll invest in a new machine and we go to do we invest in the latest version? And no, we won't invest in the latest version. What we'll do is will use an older version because the older versions are cheaper and they will do the job just the same. So why spend extra money on the latest version? So now we've made another decision. Uh, we're not investing in the latest version so we've gone down a no route. We're going to use an older version. But now we need to figure out how we're going to do this. So what we'll do is check second-hand market to see if there are good machines for sale in the second hand market that we could buy much cheaper. Now we've had a, a very simple example here about making an investment and you can see we're starting to anticipate different situations. So you can imagine if it's um, a, a, a more complex process within a company then we have many decisions to make and many actions to perform. Conducting research, working on the research, making decisions about the outcomes of the research, what if uh, the research indicated a certain course of action, should we do this, should we do that. So it's refining the way we think and it's helping us to work out what is the optimum strategy. Clearly a lot of what I'm doing here depends on the nature of the product. Um, sometimes businesses may be offering services, let's say the um, in the finance area, let's say the services of an accountant. Well in that case the flow charting exercise might be very limited. Uh, different clients for the accountant will have different requirements. They all may have to pay taxes and submit their accounts to the appropriate authorities. Uh, they also need financial advice which may vary from business to business. Um, so it's very difficult to codify it and wrap it up into boxes like we've done here for decision making. But in some situations where there is perhaps re repetitive production then flow charting is a, a very worthwhile exercise because in the event of failure of any part of the organization there is um, a good set of guidelines as to what to do to solve the problem. Multi-stage process. Well this one just simply links different stages. The process is stage one, stage two. There are different stages to the process. The stage of uh, getting the raw materials, stage two producing the raw materials, uh, producing, uh, sorry, producing the item from the raw materials 
and stage three could be polishing the the product at the end and uh, making it more presentable at the end so we have let's say three a three stage process to get a certain product so sometimes processes are not single processes they they are into different stages now we could have a multi stage process with a buffer for example stage one we produce something it goes into a buffer and out of the buffer it goes into stage two so this buffer is a storage area now this would be like push production management is ordering the business to produce a certain number of items of the product so the decisions on management who are pushing through the production management say make 500 of these items so the business tools up to start to make 500 items and when the 500 items are made they go into the stores that's the buffer then stage two the um, customers place an order and the order is met from the stores this contrasts of course with the, the pull system that we've talked about in other videos where production is pulled through the system customers place orders the orders have to be fulfilled so production is pulled through the system it's pulled through from start to finish to try and meet the orders push is when management make decisions about how many to produce um, it depends on the philosophy that the, the business is running it could be running a, a just-in-time philosophy or it could be running this idea of having a buffer in stores it depends it depends on the nature of the product it depends on the style of management other types of processes well make to order now only activated in response to actual orders this is the pull system I was talking about this system uh, they only make items that are uh, demanded by customers both work in progress and finished good inventories kept to a minimum so there is no work in progress or finished goods the items are made to order the customer places an order and gets the product and gets the product uh, within a, a speedy uh, time limit hopefully but the organization puts its efforts in immediately to making that order that's been pulled through the system now make to stock is different the processes are activated to meet expected or forecast demands so management anticipates demand in the future and it makes the product now holds it in stock and the orders when they come in eventually will be met from the stock you could say that this is a waste of resource because they're making products that are not going to be sold they're going to be held in stock so there's a lot of capital tied up in terms of raw materials labor machine time supervision time quality checks and so on so there's a lot of resource tied up in the product that's just standing idle just waiting in the stores to be ordered on the other hand it means that the resources are used continuously in the business and also customers will have a very fast turnaround on on their orders they place the order today they will have the product in a very short space of time because it's coming from stock if it's make to order they have to wait for the product to go through the production system to be made and then delivered to them so in the make to stock customer orders are served from target stocking levels so the management hold certain amounts of stock and if the management know the type of market they're in they know the seasonal factors associated with the market they know the the habits of the customers and so on they may produce for stock now the process performance matrix I said right at the start uh, when we, we started this particular video I said I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these but I want to run through them and just uh, plant the various types of uh, measurements we can have associated with performance uh, you should really make a note of these and start to research them yourselves and 
understand the significance of each one. But for example, operation time is, is the setup time divided by the run time. What proportion of the run time is taken up uh, what, what proportion of the total time is taken up by setup? If, if the machine is going to run for one hour and it takes half an hour to set up the machine, then 50% of the time is set up. That's quite significant. So perhaps setting up the machine and running it for weeks or months at a time or even dedicating the machine to just making that particular product continuously, that might be a more optimum strategy if that is possible. Depends on the demand for the product, nature of the product, the resources of the business, depends on a lot of things. Throughput time is the average time for a unit to move through the system. So how long does it take from start to finish? If we start with raw materials and we go through the various processes, then how long does it take until we have a final product? What's the average time it takes? And then the velocity, which is the, the throughput time divided by the value added time. Sometimes when we talk about throughput, we think, how long does it take for a product to get from start to finish? Well, that not, may not be value added time. That may be um, products go to one machine, they come off the machine, and then they're idle. They just sit there waiting for the next machine. So they're in a queue. They're just waiting to be processed later. But in that time they're waiting, that's a wasted resource. That resource has not been utilized. So velocity picks up on this one. Cycle time is the average time between completion units. Um, so the cycle time and throughput are, are linked, as you'd expect. Efficiency is the actual output divided by the standard output. Well, standard output means management have worked out how long it takes to make a particular product or complete a particular task. So they have some sort of benchmark. They have calculated how long it takes to complete this process, this, this particular task. And then it, they measure how long did it actually take. And that's a measure of efficiency. Of course, the standard output, the, the standard measurements, have to be objective and fair. Otherwise, the business may always look bad because the, the standards were set so high. So they have to be realistic and they have to be appropriate. Productivity is just output divided by input. It sounds very straightforward, but in fact it's complicated. Uh, outputs differ. In, in most organizations they don't make a single product, they make many products. So what do we consider to be output? Some products are complex and some products are simple. So we need to understand what we mean by productivity in terms of output, but in terms of inputs as well. Uh, different processes, different machines, different skill levels from the workers, different supervisions, different requirements for quality. Inputs are difficult to measure as well. So it seems like a very simple ratio, but in fact it can be quite complicated. Utilization is the time activated divided by the available time. That's a, a measure of utilization. Uh, how long, let's say the machine is available, as I said earlier, for 10 hours a day or 8 hours a day, let's say the company works 8 hours a day, the machine is available 8 hours a day, it's owned by the company so the machine is there, it can be used for 8 hours, let's say. Well how long is it used? If it's used 1 hour a day then it's used 12.5% of the time. It's a measure of the utilization of the machine. It could be the machine is just standing there idle. Cycle time example. Let's just give a, a quick example of how to calculate one of these. Um, we should really go through 
some additional uh, PDFs and additional videos to, to see how to calculate others and also do some research online if possible or through other sources. Suppose you had to produce 900 units in 100 hours to meet demand requirements for a product. What's the cycle time to meet this demand requirement? How long does it take to produce one unit? What's the cycle time? Well the answer is there are 6,000 minutes. 60 minutes in an hour times 100 hours. So 6,000 minutes. So the average time between completions would have to be 6,000. That's what we got, 6,000 minutes. We're going to produce 900 units, so divide by 900 units, which is 6 and 2 third minutes. So each item takes 6 and 2 third minutes. 6 minutes, uh, 67 seconds, approximately. So that would give us a measure of the uh, the cycle time per unit. Now there are different ways of looking at uh, process throughput. Uh, one is, could be through time production and uh, reduction. Sometimes if we identify bottlenecks in the production system, let's say uh, all the machines can produce um, 500 items an hour. So if all the machines can produce 500 uh, items an hour, then we should, in theory, have a continuous production line. Items coming off one machine, go to the next machine, and so on. And it would be continuous. But let's say we have um, one of the machines can only produce 300 per hour. Now that machine is going to cause a bottleneck. All the others are producing at 500 per hour. This one's only producing at 300 per hour. So is it possible, it may be, to get a second machine? So in this case, production takes place in parallel. If you get a second machine, then that bottleneck could be removed. Of course, it depends on the cost of the machine, getting another operator, employing another operator, um, the reorganization of the production facility. Uh, there are many issues, but it would solve the bottleneck. So it depends on the savings versus the cost. And management needs to do careful calculations to see if it's worthwhile producing in parallel in that situation. It could be change the sequence of activities. Flexibility is very important within business, if possible. So sometimes machines can do different tasks and uh, if there is a, a blockage or, a, or some issue, a bottleneck somewhere in the system or some issue in the system, then if there is flexibility then change the, the sequence of activities. Instead of going from machine A to machine B, go to machine C. A, C and then back to B, if that's possible. But try to change the sequence of activities and try to get flexibility into production if possible. It's also a good idea in the event of breakdown. If a machine breaks down, if that flexibility exists, then there will be very little problem associated. And try to reduce interruptions. One of the, the big sources of interruptions in many businesses is when uh, valued customers require special orders. Special orders might be low quantity orders but high value but they come from high valued customers. So the company doesn't want to alienate the customers. Uh, it's an annoyance almost but the customers want something special done. The product to be amended in some special way. And that may cause disruption in the production process. So try to avoid it, try to uh, deal with these in in some way, Maybe perhaps outsource it if it can, or uh, try to, to do it with minimal disruption, perhaps overtime working or get uh, operators to work on it um, as, as a special. 
but really this type of interruption to the, the flow of production is very it's it's annoying but it has to be done because the customers are high value the customers uh, place big orders from time to time and they always pay on time they're they're good customers it's just sometimes perhaps the place special orders and that could be a, a, an issue but you could have interruptions for all sorts of other reasons as well uh, machine breakdowns uh, there's no regular pattern to maintenance so the machine breaks down so that would be an interruption so there are ver interruptions for various types workers uh, uh, leave the organization unexpectedly or all sorts so these are some of the issues associated with processes and with process analysis um, it's an overview class. It's it contains many important ideas in this in this area of looking at processes within organizations. Well worth looking at a few times and making your own notes and do some extra reading in the area. Well that's all we're going to deal with in this session, so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.